I'd like you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 27. We probably this morning will only be looking at two passages of Scripture. Matthew 27 and John 19. We'll be looking at one other one if you want to find it in your Bible. You can look for the book of Amos. The book of Amos. You say the book of who? A-M-O-S. It's in the Minor Prophets. Near Matthew. Much closer to Matthew than the book of Genesis. We'll be turning there a little bit. The darkest hours. Dr. Park Tucker, former chaplain of the Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia, told of walking down the street one day And he was down. Even preachers get down. People get down. And the question is, when was the darkest hour in your life? Can you look back and see a time in your life that you've been down at the bottom? Emotionally, maybe physically. Well, Dr. Tucker was down. He was walking the streets in Atlanta, Georgia. And he was feeling really low that day, just like there was a cloud over him, a dark cloud. And he uh, was just concerned about life, things happening. I'm sure his job as a chaplain is not easy, especially in the penitentiary. And as he was walking down, he, he was passing a funeral home. And there was a big sign in the window. And it read, Why walk around half dead? We can bury you for $69.50. We also give green stamps. Now you know how old that is. What's a green stamp? Uh, the sign actually cheered him up. He laughed as he walked down the street and it was good medicine for his soul. You know, as we walk in through in life and uh, we are challenged and struggling, we find that worry and darkness often cling to each other. And sometimes there's no path for recovery, or at least we feel that way. We surrender to the fate of defeat sometimes in our life and the, the things just see, keep going in a negative way. And, and as it says, sometimes when it rains, it pours. And instead of having just one problem, you have five or ten. And we struggle with that. And, and we get under this cloud and we don't find a way out. We just cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. The dark hour right now in your life. You may be facing it right now, today. I know this last week was a dark time for the Miller family. I went up to the hospital at least four times. And the last time I was called, Bob said, I think she's dying. That was eight o'clock in the evening after our date night. And um, went up to the hospital she nearly lasted another five hours after that, and she was grasping for breath. The, the, the gurgle in the throat e with each breath that came in. She was struggling physically. She was in comatose, no pain, but the family was in pain. And looking for answers. In fact, I had been there two days before and she was ready to die and she said, I, I'm ready to go. I hope the Lord takes me. 
tough times when we go through those dark hours and wondering about is there any way out of the darkness, out of that struggle in life. Jesus, in our story today, is facing his darkest hours. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying to the Father, sweat just pouring out of him, emotional, draining sweat. His heart was heavy. He knew that he was facing the most critical time in his life for the very purpose that he came to this planet to die. But it wasn't the death that was the darkest hour. It wasn't dying. He wasn't afraid to die, obviously. He wasn't afraid to face death. It's wonderful to have a saint of God say to you in the hospital bed, I am ready to die. I know where I'm going. I know what lies ahead. And as we face that one day, there may be dark hours that precede that in our life. Jesus' final words on the cross are going to express to you and me two messages when he faced those darkest hours. And as he faces those, he expresses himself. You see, Jesus is very transparent, isn't he? He doesn't hold back. He shares from his heart. He communicates honestly, openly, and truly. And so as we go through these last hours on this earth for Jesus, I hope that we will take away some lessons and that we will apply them to our lives. First message that I want to talk about that Jesus expresses is one of abandonment. I want to go to Matthew 25, 27, verse 45, and just read this short passage. Verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling on Elijah. And one of them once at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on the reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Darkness covers the earth. As I sat there studying over the past months on this passage, I asked myself the question, what's happening right now? What is God communicating? Why three hours? Why not six? Why not one? A lot of people would look at three and say it represents something. And that's fine. But the darkness, the darkness is total black. Why is the darkness happening at this time? I mean, is there significance to the fact that the darkness itself is expressing to those that are around the cross? I want you to go to Amos, as I've asked you to find it. Hopefully you've found it. If you haven't found it, there's still time. Amos chapter 8, I think, is being fulfilled, my opinion. 
You know, I've read through Amos many, many times. This is the first time I've seen this prophecy. I want to go up to verse 3 because I want you to get a little bit of the flavor that's coming through in this passage. Verse 3 says, And the songs of the temple shall become wailing in that day, declares the Lord God. So many dead bodies there are thrown out everywhere. Silence. Just silence. Why? Because there's so many dead people. In 70 AD, this will be fulfilled. I believe. Verse 4. Hear this. You Jews who trample on the needy, bring poor of the land into an end. And when will the new moon be, they say? When will it be over? That we will sell grain in the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances. What is he talking about? He's talking about cheating. He's talking about stealing by selling a short pound, or selling something on the marketplace and making lots of money, but it's not all pure, as they say. Verse 6 says, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. They sell the stuff that really isn't worth anything. They're cheating one another in the marketplace. Verse 8, no, verse 7. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Why? Because they're sinful. They're not putting their faith in God, in Jehovah. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it? Verse 9. And verse 9 is the key verse. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Amos 8, 9. Don't forget that passage. We find ourselves in the book of Matthew that at noon, the sun turned black. I'm saying, what happened? God didn't have the earth revolve instantaneously. God somehow shielded the sunlight from the earth, reflecting it all away, not the heat, but the a light of it, so that at noon, instantaneously, not because of a eclipse, but because of the power of God, he stopped the sunlight from hitting the earth. I believe that the entire earth was in darkness at noon, Jerusalem time that day. I believe the entire planet went around groping as it were night without a moon, without stars, and they were groping to find their way wherever they were some of them on journeys, some of them in their homes, some of them shopping, imagine, waiting for the lights to turn on for three hours, in the shopping mall, waiting and waiting and waiting. I will make the sun go down at noon, God says. I will darken this planet. It's a time of mourning, the sins of the people of Israel, are going to be seen by God. He knows every person when they cheat someone else. He knows every person that takes in bribes. He knows every person that is a thief. He knows. And if we are not covered by the blood of Christ, God will not forget our sin. The prophetic words are now being fulfilled in the book of Matthew. I just want to go a little bit further. Would you come with me to Amos chapter 8 and look a little bit farther with me? Verse 10 says, I will turn your feast into mourning and all the songs into lamentation. 
I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning, the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. What a sad morning, grieving time. The Jews are going to face that down the road. It says here in verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, the Lord God says, when I will bring a famine on the land, not a famine of food or bread or for thirst of water, but a famine of hearing the word of God. My fear for America is that one day we will have a famine of the word of God. And why? Because we are rejecting it as a nation. We are rejecting what God has given to us, has bountifully. We have Bibles more than we can count in our homes. And yet we reject. And so we find that the bitter day of lamentation is going to come for the Jews. And the days are coming when there's going to be a famine for the words of the Lord, verse 11. And they're going to seek the word of the Lord and not find it. Isn't that terrible? To want to seek truth and not be able to find it. Jesus' words of being deserted are here as we read in verse 45, 46. Verse 46, I'm looking back at Matthew 27. It says about the ninth hour, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That expression is full of emotion. It's appeal to God saying, why have you taken and deserted me? The agonizing expression of alienation. If you would put yourself in Jesus' place, although we could never do that. I want you to understand what's happening, and I'm not sure that this is all clear to me. But as I've studied, I've come up with some conclusions. He says, my God, my God. It's in the genitive in the Greek, and that means it's possessive. My God. When you go to prayer, is it my God? Or do we just pray our Heavenly Father? My Heavenly Father, personal connection, relationship. This is how he prayed. Then he said, you've forsaken me. You've left me alone. There's no one to help me now. What happened? Here, Jesus is hanging on the cross. How was he forsaken? How was he alienated? How was he deserted? Did Christ's deity leave him? Think about this. He was the man God or the God man. Did his deity, did his God part of him leave? We find in the book of Matthew that in the book of Luke that Mary was going to have a child and that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her, that he would take and he would make that sperm that would create that child inside of her womb. The Holy Spirit came in. Is the Holy Spirit now leaving Jesus? What's happening in that darkest hour of time? There is a disconnect between the Father and the Son. And I want you to understand, I believe that the Holy Spirit was always the interceder between the Father and the Son. That is, Jesus did all of his miracles with the power of the Holy Spirit. God the Father was in heaven and he gave permission to the Holy Spirit in order that Jesus might do those miracles that he might know things that most people wouldn't know, that he would be able to even forgive sins, as we saw last week. 
Did Jesus feel like an unsaved person? Huh. He was bearing the sin of the world at this moment of time. My sins were being placed upon him when the darkness came. Your sins, if you're a Christian, were placed upon him when the darkness came. Well, what does an unsaved person feel like? They were dead in trespasses and sins, which means that there was spiritual death, not physical death, spiritual death that happened. Jesus had to bear the sin of the world, and when he did that, was he spiritually dead? Before we were Christians, we were spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. Did he become like that for that time and bore the sin of the world? Did this last through the burial and until the resurrection? That is that Jesus took upon himself the sin of the world and he bore that sin for those three hours and beyond, even to death and even to the burial and even to the resurrection? Because it isn't until the resurrection that he comes to life. I just want you to think about those things. At least you know how my mind works and what I think about sometimes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 says, How Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again according to the scriptures. The gospel is he just didn't die on the cross. The gospel is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The completeness of the gospel. Did he bear our sins from beginning to end at the 12th hour of the day or our noon time until the resurrection? You can think about that. Just real quickly, the bystanders were by there, and they were saying, oh, he's calling on Elijah. They gave him some sour wine. He receives it. They wanted to wait to make sure. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is in despair. He is facing the coming hours. This is the hour he feared. He feared the moment that his father would separate himself through the Holy Spirit from him in order that he might bear the sin of the world. Because Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 says, God cannot look at sin. In the garden, the angels came and ministered to Jesus on the cross. There were no angels. Nobody ministered to him. He was dying on the cross alone. And Jesus would die alone for you, for me. Deserted, forsaken. One passage of scripture that we have for ourselves is that I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. It's a wonderful verse. It's a verse of security, a verse that God comes alongside us and says, I love you so much, and when you accept my son as your personal savior, I will never, ever leave you nor forsake you in your life. God's presence is in our life, around our lives, surrounding us, protecting us. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. And then, of course, we have this wonderful passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 39, that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God. So thankful for God's willingness to come and to be a part of our lives. But I need to go on. The second message that I find here is one of accomplishment, one of abandonment, but also one of accomplishment. I'd like you to turn to the book of John chapter 19. It says in verse 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Jesus was ready to finish his course. 
He understood. He comprehended. He had the ability to understand what was happening. Notice he says, I thirst for the first time. He's concerned about his, his own physical being, concerned about himself. All the way through, he's concerned about others. He's concerned about the people of Jerusalem. But now he understands. He understands the fact that he is going to have to yield up his spirit. Matthew 27. In the book of Luke, he says that he committed his spirit to the Heavenly Father. In John chapter 19, he gave up his spirit, as we will read here in verse 30. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up the spirit. His spirit. His final words to telestai in the Greek means a successful finish, means to complete, to finish, and to end the situation that he was in, to finish his work, the work of going through the agony of being separated with his heavenly father, because you know when death comes, the body and the spirit separate from each other. It's interesting, this is perfect tense, which means that what he did on that day, on dying on the cross, the results of that action continue on to this very day in 2019. God's desire is that we might have and understand and be able to grasp those dark hours and what Jesus did for us on the cross that we might be able to put it to practice in our lives and that we might be able to live it for him. His final action, he gave over, he handed over his spirit. Basically he was saying here, <laughs> I'm willing to die. You need to understand before noon of that day, he had no sin. At noon of that day, when that darkness covered the land, he was now taking upon himself the sin of the world, your sin and my sin. And death happened shortly thereafter. And when death happens, as it says in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, when our spirit leaves us, we die. You know, you might like to die some way, sometime in your life because of pain, because of the situation that you're going through, but it's not until the Spirit of God is taken out of you. Jesus not only gave his Spirit, but he was saying to the Hef Heavenly Father, I'm ready, I'm giving myself in death for the sins of the world. I will die for them. In Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18, it says that Rebekah, when she died, when her soul left her, she died. When our soul and spirit leave us, we physically die. We live forever. We will live forever. In the country of Turkey, a man by the name of Ali Yusel was a turkey, turkey watch repairman. He built a grave. Uh, I don't think this was it. Uh, I tried to find it on the website. But he built it so that he would have an eight inch window to be able to uh, take and see out or them see in. Uh, he installed a push button alarm system that just in case they buried him alive and he was able to reach out and get a hold of the alarm system and push the button that he would, they would come and the guards would come and, and uh, take him out. They also had this little eight inch, uh, we'll say window. And he also installed a light so that when they buried him, the light went on and it was going to stay on for one week so that the guards would every half hour check to make sure that he was dead. Uh, some people have a fear of that, that they're going to bury me alive because there have been some stories, I'm told, that people have experienced that. 
Death is not a pleasant thing to face, is it? And you may be a Christian here this morning and you're afraid to die. Really. Even though you believe that Jesus paid it all, even though you believe that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses you from all your sin, the issue is, have we come to the point <coughs> to fully trust Jesus? Fully trust him and his finished work on the cross for our sins. His blood, his body, reflecting upon his death for you right now. I want to take some time to reflect on it. Had a shorter message this morning purposely so that we might take time to reflect on the darkest hour, to reflect on what Jesus did for you and for me on the cross. It is the most important moment of your life when you place your faith and trust in him. That happened for me 53 years ago. Has it happened for you in your life? If you were in that hospital bed and it was you dying, gasping for air, would you have the peace of God? Would you relax in knowing that whether you died in five minutes or five hours, that you would go home to be with Jesus Christ? That's when your faith is put to the greatest test. That may be the darkest hour of your entire life. Or is it something that just you're okay with? We'll let God take care of that. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, we invite you to do so right now don't have to be a member of Grace Bible Church to partake with us. You need to be a member of the family of God to really understand what it's all about. We invite you to partake. And the reason we partake of this table in order for us to reflect and remember what Jesus did on that cross, what he did in that darkest hour, that he died and shed his blood for our sins. You and I are going to be thanking God forever and ever and ever. No end for what he has done for us. And the magnitude of what he did for us on that cross 2,000 years ago probably will never be realized until we get into the very presence of God and realize he died for me. He saved me from my sins. He gave me eternal life. It is then that we will really be thankful. I'd like to have the Board of Elders come up here this morning. And Greg, would you help us out this morning? I trust that your heart is ready to receive this. And, and, and where are you spiritually in your life right now? Are you walking close to the Lord? Are there things in your life maybe that need to be changed? Things in your life that may need to be worked through with God? 
maybe even confessed and say, God, you know, I've been dealing with this sin in my life and I, I want to get rid of it and I really would like, I'd like your help to help me through this. I don't know where you are. You and God, that's the way it is. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ as Savior, and you would like to do it right now. Pray this prayer, mean it with all of your heart between you and God. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for my sins. I want to place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ right now as my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. If you prayed that prayer and meant it with all of your heart, God reached down here and saved your soul and put inside of you the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be reminded of the death of Christ. Thank you for the opportunity to take a wafer or a piece of cracker and focus on that element that we might be able to reflect on the body of Christ that was given for us. We pray, God, that as we hold the element for a short time. And as we take and reflect on his body, that you might allow us to reflect on our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As the men pass the uh, waiver or the cracker out, go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, we trust that you will just reflect and think and pray and meditate, a time of self-evaluation, a time of reflection. You might look to him 